I hate to tell you this, but your R code will fail. That's okay, it happens to you, it happens to me, it happens to the best of us. Well, maybe not that guy, but everyone else's R code will fail at some point. And I know this can be super frustrating to hear, why won't you work? But you can try to avoid that with the try catch function. With this function, you can take unsafe parts of your code and wrap it into try catch so that your code can feel all nice and fuzzy. And when things go wrong, try catch can then initiate some fallback plan. But in order for all of this to work, we have to set up a couple of things first. And in today's video, I'm going to show you how that works. So let's dive in. All right, in my quarto file, I've already included a code chunk that provokes an error and then tries to print hello to the console. So basically, if I were to only execute this part, you'd see a simple hello. But if I try to execute the whole code chunk, you see that an error happens in between, namely an error with the message error in all caps. Really frightening, I know. But let's try to get a handle on this. You see, what I'd like to do is to execute this whole code chunk, but make sure that the error doesn't crash everything and the subsequent code, in this case, this simple hello statement, still executes and can be seen in the console. And for that, the try catch function is perfect. What you need to do is to use the try catch function. And then you see in the first argument, it expects an expression and expressions are nothing but code. Basically, you can put an R code into these curly brackets and the whole code chunk becomes one expression. So let's stick our stop statement in here, you know, the thing that provokes the error and try to execute this as is. Now we do get another error, at least it looks a little bit different here, but the result is still the same. Our hello code doesn't execute. And the thing is, this try catch statement first tries to do the expression. So basically tries to execute all of the code that comes in curly brackets, but it also needs instructions to catch the error when one occurs. So that is why we tell it inside of the try catch function, just like a normal argument, we tell it, you know what, I'm going to explain to you how to handle errors. And a way to handle errors is always via a function that takes an argument often called E, has an error, and then uses this error object to do stuff. So in this case, we could just write out a message using the message function that says there was an error. So now if we try to execute this whole code chunk, we do see here now that our message occurred, but also we see that the hello part was also executed. So this is a nice way to make sure that one simple error doesn't crash our complete code, but instead does some graceful thing like just notifying us, you know what, there was an error, no biggie, I can execute the part that comes after that. But as you can see right now, we don't actually catch the error. I mean, we catch it in the sense that we do something with it, but at the end, we have no idea what went wrong. That's not particularly nice, so that is why we can use this error object that we called E, but we could also call it error object. It doesn't matter, the code stays the same. People just like to use this E as a short, small argument name. But we haven't actually used this inside of our function. Maybe if we were to print this as well, we could also see the error that occurred. So let's use the glue function and stick this into and stick this into the message function. And then inside of the glue function, we can stick in this E error object. And now if we execute this, we do see here now that we get more information. There was an error and then the error was, okay, error in do try catch. This was the exact same thing we have just seen earlier. This whole message here is executed. But maybe we only want to get the message. We could also make this text a little bit nicer by throwing in a colon in there. So now it says there was an error and then we can really see this whole thing here is put into our text that we assemble with glue. But what if we only want to get the error message instead of having this whole thing in here? Then we can use the E object and we know that all the error objects that are triggered will have an attribute called message. And now if you execute this, you do see here now that there was an error and it was message, namely the exact error that we have seen here and we don't have this where it occurred anymore. So this is a nice way to make your error messages a little bit 
shorter and conciser. You know, because no one has time to read through six lines of error documentation, you just want to get straight to the points, okay? I know the error message is error. Cool, so these were kind of the mechanics of the try-catch function, so we now know how to use this thing. But let's try to do something more meaningful because I have just provoked an error here using the stop function. Let's try to do something you might actually use in real life. Let's try to set the value to something my variable. My variable isn't defined, so you might run into a typical issue with you trying to assign stuff that R doesn't know. So now if we execute this, we see once again that our error handling was perfectly executed. We see that there was an error, the error message was printed to us, but the rest of the code still executed. So that's nice. But this error handling is really a chance to not just tell people there is an error, you can also define a fallback. You know, what we could do instead is to say the value should be 5 instead. Whenever there is an error, when this thing isn't there, let's just go with our default value. And we can also go with another message that says, uh, I don't know, fallback plan executed. Okay. So now if we execute this, we see now, okay, there was an error and we still have the error message. We also see the second message that says the fallback plan was executed and the rest of the code worked. So technically this did something, but let's try to make sure that it actually does what we think it does. Let's try to use our value now inside of the glue function that we execute here. Let's go with value. And then if we try to execute this whole thing, we see now, okay, we do get the error message like before, and we try to execute our glue function once again. But this time we get another error that says, okay, the object couldn't be found. And this might feel confusing because you can probably accept that you tried to assign the variable val, but this didn't work. But then we had our fallback plan that should have assigned something. And this is technically true, but you have to understand that this happens in different environments. You see, if you look into your environment tab, you still see that the environment is empty. Even though this assignment here must have gone through because we have executed this whole part successfully. But still, we don't see this value inside of our environment because this was executed in a separate environment. But if you think about it, this makes sense. You have defined a new function and inside of this function, you have defined a value, but you never returned anything. So there are two ways to handle this. One is probably the one you should do. And the other one is just a really advanced trick that I want to show you. It's probably not that wise to use it in a setting like this, but still it works perfect. Let's start with the first one that you should do. You see the try catch thing is like a function. That's why you have the regular parentheses at the beginning and at the end of everything. So you can think of the try catch as a function that might return something. So this is why we can just take our variable assignment and stick it in front of the try catch. So here we say, okay, first try to execute this code chunk. And the last thing, just like in a function that is executed, will be returned as the value, provided that it works, of course. And if there is an error, then we try to execute our error handler, which is nothing but a function. And we want to have the fallback value returned, which means that we just return something at the end, in this case, the one assignment that we did. So now if I execute this, we do see here now that, okay, hello five worked. We now see here that the five is in that string. So this was the wise approach of how to do variable assignment using try catch where things might go wrong. The other thing that you could do is to well, first let's copy this so that we have the two cases separately and let's reassemble what we've had before. Now if I execute this, this part still works because in my environment, I still have this value five from before. So let's just make this into 5,000 so that we see that the value remains unchanged and we will see later on that. And we know when we are successful, when we see that in here, this new fallback number 5,000 is printed. Now, since we know that these things here happen in different environments that are nested into our large global environment that contains all of our variables, since we know that this is the case, we can use the special assignment operator that uses this extra special arrow. Basically, this operator doesn't just assign this variable val inside of its current environment, but also 
in the environment that it is nested in. In our case, that's the global environment. So this is why if we execute this, we see here now that our error handling is still perfectly fine, but now we also see that the value was changed. So that's a pretty advanced trick that you could do if you wanted to, but beware that this can cause issues really fast. So try not to do it. I just really wanted to show you this neat operator here because it can be useful in some situations. So when in doubt, do this first approach here where you use the value assignment outside of the try catch function. Finally, there are two more things that I want to show you. One is related to the CLI package, which makes error handling much nicer. See, if we take this code from before, let's just go with the initial version. We use the message function here and then we stick glue inside of that. With the CLI package, we can actually save us some steps. So let's get rid of this part here and use the CLI package where we use the CLI alert function. And this one will give us some information. And then we don't need this extra parentheses here anymore. And I will leave this for now as is because then we can easily see the difference. So now if we execute this, we see here that our value was changed back to five. So everything worked as expected. And also our error handling was also triggered. But we see that things look a little bit different now because there is a nice info icon now instead of just this orange text. So we could use this in both cases here and then things look a little bit nicer. As you can probably guess, we can also use other alert functions, not just info. We could also use alert success that we successfully executed our fallback plan. And the nice thing about the CLI package is that it allows you to do some extra styling. For example, we could modify our fallback plan execution message and say something like that the, that the value was set to, and then let's just go with val here. And then we see, okay, value was set to five but we can also style this thing here. Maybe we should call this val as well. And then we say, okay, this should now look like a variable. So let's just throw this into curly brackets and then use the dot val class. And then we stick in the value in there. And then it says val was set to five. And you see now that the styling is a little bit nicer. There are other kind of styling classes. I don't want to go through all of them, but for example, you could use the arc style as well. And then things are styled with these back ticks to indicate that this is an argument. But here I want to use the val class because it's nice for values. And now notice that whatever you put in here is just treated as text, which is a bit different than the glue syntax you might be used to. So just be aware of that. Whatever you stick in here will now be treated as a text. But if you really want to have this thing executed as a code, you could also stick this into another set of curly brackets and then you'd see that this evaluates to five now, which isn't what I want to do in this case, but just so you're aware of how to do that. So with that, you know how to do more nicer error messages when you do error handling, which is nice. And I kind of want to stress that this is a nice chance to leave breadcrumbs for yourself in the future when you might not remember all of the details of your code, so you might as well leave some detailed error message for your future self. So this was one thing and another thing that one is kind of more technical. I just wanted to show you that with try catch, you can also catch messages and not only errors. For example, if we throw this in here and let's just assume that our assignment here was done properly and we put in a message that says all is well. Cool. Now, if we execute this, we see here that there is this message. This means that this thing here must have executed without any errors. Now with the try catch, you can also catch these messages. So if there is a message, you could do something else like saying there was a message. And then if you execute this, you do see here now that instead of printing the all as well message, we see now the there was a message message. And if you wanted to have this in an info way, you could use the CLI function again. And then you see there is a message and you could once again use the message of the object that is thrown. So you could use E and then set message in here. And then you see there was a message all as well. That's nice. That's good to know how very kind of R to let us know that everything is well. And just so you know, I have already mentioned that the name of the function argument doesn't make any difference, but typically when people deal with messages, they like to use M instead of E but that's just a preference that you can use or not. 
So with that, I hope I could demystify the try catch function for you. Feel free to let me know in the comments if that was the case. And if you enjoyed this video, then I'm certain that you're going to enjoy my data cleaning masterclass, which will help you get much faster at data cleaning so that you don't have to spend hours on trying to get your data right. And if you want to see some other videos that I have in store for you, you can check out this playlist here where you have a whole bunch of videos that you can choose from. So with that said, thank you for watching and I will see you next time.